All right, welcome back to another subbrief. All right, Project 667 BD, the Delta II SSBN, known as Marina M. The Dash M stands for modernization. So, this is a modernized version of the Marina, and Marina was Delta I. So, Marina M. If we look at this picture real quick, I want to answer a Patreon question that somebody had asked, and it was a really good question. He's like, a lot of these masks and antennas in the sale are only identified by acronyms, like uh, the conical shaped antenna there on the drawings is AP uh, SOPS, SOPS. He's like, well, what, what in the world does SOPS mean? So uh, in that one case, that is a satellite communication antenna that they use uh, for Obviously, you know, communications and behind that, it looks like the, it's either a, an attack periscope or some kind of whip antenna that could be a like a high frequency or a high gain antenna behind them there. So great question. I'll try to answer those as I get the answers. Uh, I had not responded to uh, that particular question in Patreon chat just sim simply because I don't know the answer yet. Uh, but I'm continuously trying to learn more and more about these. And I understand the frustration of uh, seeing acronyms without what the acronym means. And I, I feel you there because I'm in the same way. So look at these Fairwater planes. The Fairwater planes are the control surfaces that are attached to the sail of the submarine. Different navies and different countries call these different things. The American Navy, we call it Fairwater planes. Look how they're facing directly up or vertical there. That's something that they can do with the Delta to assist them in punching through the ice because they're surfacing from dead stop below the ice coming straight up through the ice. And that kind of helps cut through the ice without damaging these control surfaces because inside that is simply a large steel sleeve with a, uh, a pinion in it that controls the angle of the Fairwater planes. And that pinion, given enough weight of ice on it, could bend. And that would be terrible because they wouldn't have good control of their fairwater planes after that. That's one of the few surfaces that control where the submarine goes. So they certainly don't want to damage that. So what they've done is they've made it so that it pivots vertically like the American 637 attack submarine uh, had the same feature and they could pinch through. Let's get started. All right, so who's designing the Delta II? Well, it's the Rubin Submarine Design Bureau made by our chief designer Kovalev. Well, Sergey's down there drawing submarines and they're building them. In 1972, Sergey issues a tactical and technical assignment to the Delta I project, which is the birth of the Delta II project. He wants to increase the missile load of the Delta to, from 12 to 16 missiles. This is in part uh, because the Yankee had 16 ballistic missiles and this new and improved Delta only has 12. So to the powers that be that are outside the Navy circles, but are in the political structure of running the Soviet Union, may be questioning why our newest submarine has fewer missiles, comrade. How can this possibly be better? And there's a whole list, a laundry list of things that are better about the Delta that the Yankee did not have. But one thing the Yankee does have is more missile tubes. And it's one thing politicians can do is they can count missile tubes. You know, they're like, well, we need to have at least 16 is part of the reason why they did this tactical and technical assessment or assignment and made this change. The new project name is going to be 667 Bravo Delta or Marina M, a Marina Modernization. All right. And this is what it looks like. If you are a Patreon, you already have this technical drawing. I recommend you bring it up now so you can see the whole submarine. I'm just showing you the missile compartment here. The missile compartment is divided into two halves. The forward half is compartment four. The aft half, the one to the left there, is compartment five. Two watertight compartments, they're identical to each other. They can operate independently of each other in case one takes damage. So they're just basically one copy of another. And all they did was add another pair of missile tubes to each compartment. So compartment four got two tubes, compartment five got two tubes, increasing the overall launch volume of missiles from 12 to 16. This added approximately 1,500 tons of displacement to the submarine, lengthened a hull by about 16 meters, and reduced the speed by approximately one knot. So they sacrificed one knot on the top end, for a lot of additional firepower and making the comrade at the Kremlin happy. 
So let's talk about the R29 Delta. This is the modified SSN-8 that came out in 1978. This is a two-stage liquid fuel rocket. Uh, it launches a single warhead. So a little bit of a step back there, because remember, the R29 could have up to three warheads that were small. But this has one warhead that can be between 0.6 megatons and 1.5 megatons. And if you are uh, one of our viewers that does a lot of their own research, which I encourage you all to do, you may see some numbers like I did that says the warhead is 0.8 or the warhead is 1.1 megatons. All those values are correct. The range of the yield of the single warhead is somewhere between 0.6 and 1.5. And any number in between those two values are right. It's a 13 meter tall missile, just like the Delta One was shooting. Uh, approximately 1.8 meters in diameter, but the range, the efficiency of this engine is increased to over 9,000 kilometers. And this has a significant impact on how the Delta II is employed. She no longer needs to go north of Hawaii or into the North Atlantic. She doesn't, she can, but she doesn't need to. She can simply hit targets in Europe right from her pier or go into the Arctic Circle and hit targets in Canada and North America from up there and, and Europe as well. So this brings the entire Delta II class much closer to home waters. And that is a significant tactical advantage because every deployment, every one that we're gonna talk about today that's in the Arctic region has air support. They have long range maritime uh, TU-95 Bear Foxtrots overhead when they're not under ice, helping them out, communicating with them, letting them know any assets in the area, you know, and just maintaining communication. Make sure, hey, comrade, are you okay? We're overhead. We're looking out for you. And that gives them a lot of peace of mind and a significant tactical advantage. And that was all born by this increased range. They no longer had to go very far to do their strategic job. And the accuracy of the new Delta mod, two is one kilometer circle accuracy. That is a decrease in variance from 3.5 kilometers down to one. So it's a more accurate um, area where the warhead is gonna land. And of course she has the same astro correction system that refines, refines the vehicle's flight mid-flight in the suborbital part of the phase. And there's a little foreshadowing here. I went ahead and filled out the rest of this graph for uh, the viewers here. Uh, Delta three is our next lecture. We're gonna be talking about that missile, the R29R, which is the next variant. We're talking about R29D right now. So we're gonna go from the 29 to the 29D to the 29R. And then finally Delta four will be coming in uh, October, November timeframe, uh, R29RM. And then uh, we've already done the Typhoon brief, but the Typhoon just for example, uh, was the next evolution of this missile, and it, that is the R-39 or the SSN-20. Uh, a real quick reminder about the Typhoon. It's real easy to remember the SSN-20 because the Typhoon had 20 missile tubes. So 2020s, that's, that's how I found an easy way to remember that stuff. Okay, let's move on. We're talking about Delta II today. Let's move on. Delta II by the numbers, the length is 155 meters, comrade, a little bit longer than the Delta I. That's because we're adding missile tubes to the missile compartment. Her beam is the same, 12 meters around, test depth is 400 meters. The crew is 130 sailors. That's a lot of sailors for a Soviet boat. Yeah, they like to keep their crews a little bit less than American boats. And the way they do that is they automate everything that they can. That torpedo room that loads the torpedo tubes, all robot operated, automated. You go to the control room, you hit the button that says tube one, you hit the other button that says torpedo, and the, automatically the robots, the robot arms, the mechanical hydraulic arms begin moving by themselves in the torpedo room with no people uh, telling it to do anything other than that. We'll load that torpedo into that selected tube and prepare it for launch. But you can only automate so much, especially in the 60s and 70s. So. They uh, have 130 sailors operating mostly in this missile compartment and the engine room. Uh, they have the same nuclear reactors as the Delta I, the same torpedo tubes, all facing forward. Uh, there's two different sizes, torpedo tubes, 53 centimeter and the 40 centimeter. There's 40 centimeters, every one of those is electric. So electric uh, torpedoes, called lightweight torpedoes. They're very fast. Um, they start up right away. They're scary as hell when they start up because they sound like an electric drill to me. 
other people may have different opinions about what they sound like, but out of nowhere you hear electric drill and it's uh, it starts up immediately. Whereas the 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 larger torpedoes, uh, the fifty three centimeters, those can be electric, but more times than not they're thermal, which means they're gas powered like gasoline, but it's a diesel fuel type mixture. Anyway, I digress. Those because they're so big take a few seconds to spin up. They're like chug 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 chug, you know, and then they start running real fast at you. Whereas the 40 centimeters, they're just on, they're doing 40 knots and they're coming at you. And I'm like, Oh Jesus, you know, time to go. You know, there's like no warning with those little torpedoes. They'll get you. All right. Two shafts um, on at the end of each shaft, they have screw blade. A screw blade is normally five screws, five blades rather. Uh, later on, some of them did get the seven bladed screw, which was a little bit quieter than the five bladed screw. She could do about 25 knots approximately. That's, you know, give or take. Remember she lost about a knot with the uh, increased weight. She can shoot 16 R29 Delta missiles now, which is great. She has the Almaz fire control system, which is a different fire control system than Delta one. So it's a little bit improved there, but it didn't change the missile fire sequence at all. So that's more of a tactical fire control system or maybe a ship's control system because they tend to integrate integrate that stuff uh, in the Russian Navy, where in the American Navy, that's two different systems. Okay, the Tobol B navigation system is the inertial gyro navigation system. That's the gyro that's spinning like thousands of times a second. And what it measures is the motion of the submarine from moment to moment. And it dead reckoning plots the position based on how that gyro wiggles and wobbles based on the motion of the submarine very accurate system for a short period of time. Obviously, the longer you go without resetting that gyro to a known GPS or geographical position, the more error you get over time, okay? But it's really good for a short period of time, the tow ball. Uh, the Millennia LCOM system, that's a satellite communication system going back to that um, special antenna that we were talking about earlier. There's a couple, there's a, there's a lot of antennas on the Delta. Uh, that's because the ballistic missile submarine has multiple communication suites, but the, the Millennia is the, the the, pro, the primary one. And the Kirch sonar is the, uh, the the active sonar that's on a passive sonar as well. The Kirch sonar is the same sonar on the doggone Victors, you know, and the Charlies too. They, they, they put the same sonar on both. Uh, the, and it has an active mode. You could have a Delta one, two, three, or four ping active at you. Yeah. And it'll be Kirch. It'd be three kilohertz. Yeah. I probably shouldn't have said that, but let's move on. Uh, the, sorry, they're, they're, they're all decommissioned. I'm joking. Okay, but what is the difference between the Delta Twos? Uh, the Delta Twos and the Delta Ones, this is the laundry list of things that they improved whenever the politicians were like, hey, comrade, we just want more missiles. But they went ahead and gave the comrades the more missiles. Then they improved the main engines by mounting them on a floating deck. Now, a floating deck is um, where you mount the plate that is a metal plate that is uh, supporting the main engines. So imagine this a massive amount of machinery that's very heavy. If you weld that to the deck, it's gonna be noisy as hell. All that spinning machinery is gonna be going out into the ocean, right? So that, that plate that the main engines sit on, they put that on what's called a raft. And uh, it's literally a piece of rubber, okay? And that piece of rubber is like on springs and on other pieces of rubber. And all these pieces of rubber have different densities and, and different densities of rubber or absorbing material, I'm using rubber as a generic term, absorb different frequencies, right? And they also support different weights. And because they're so heavy, you have to have a have real dense rubber with a real dense spring under it. But you can then break up that weight with a port forward spring and a port starboard after spring that has a little less, a little bit softer rubber to absorb different frequencies, still supporting the same weight, just in different areas, kind of sharing the load a little bit. And it's combi this combination of rubbers and springs supporting these massive engines is what is known as a floating deck. And it's not as big as I'm making it sound, but it is a multi-tier sound absorption system. And they improve that with the Delta II. She's going to patrol mostly in the Arctic region due to the increased missile range. Fair water planes rotate 90 degrees for ice ascent. Uh, she has topside cameras. This is really cool. Uh, something that the Americans didn't have until much later in the Cold War, like it, towards the end, actually, uh, was topside looking cameras that are mounted on the deck looking upwards. So they can like sail around, turn on the boob tube, you know, the little television screen and look up at the ice or if there's no ice, up through the water. See if there's any airplanes or helicopters up there. 
And the idea is uh, it's for under ice uh, viewing so that whenever they surface, they can make sure that they're not making a mistake and going into something that they're, that they're not intending to. There are other ways to measure ice thickness with sonar systems that they do as well, but they have these really cool topside cameras that I thought that I would mention. They have the Alamaz fire control system, which is improved fire control. They use electrolysis for the first time to make oxygen. The Delta II is the first Soviet Union ballistic missile submarine to use electrolysis, zapping electricity through seawater to separate hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen they dump overboard, the oxygen they put in a big old oxygen tank. And then they slowly bleed that oxygen over time throughout the submarine or into the fan room that pushes it in throughout the submarine to keep the oxygen level up. So the other thing in the atmosphere that's really toxic to humans is carbon dioxide. Every time we exhale, we're exhaling a little bit of carbon dioxide. So they have what's called a solid regenerator that scrubs the CO2. And this is what the Americans are using. And the I don't know if they got the idea from us or if they just thought of it as the same time, you know, as, as we did. But what this is, is a chemical liquid that passes through a solid regenerator that looks like a wafer, looks like a honeycomb. Okay, the honeycomb gets hot um, and it releases uh, the CO2 so that it can be pumped overboard. Okay, and as it goes through this honeycomb, it goes through a cooling area where we cool this liquid um, and it goes into an area where we blow water, air through it from the fan room where people have, you know, where there's atmosphere in the submarine uh, and it blows through this uh, liquid and absorbs the CO2. Then the CO2 is pumped after it's had air blown through and it's CO2 heavy now, it goes through this solid regenerator material that's warm and it releases the CO2 from the liquid again. And it's this closed loop waterfall. And it imagine it is actually a waterfall because it has to go through the solid regenerator material and it waterfalls down. You know, it's approximately, the machine is approximately six feet high. Uh, the actual waterfall itself is maybe only four feet high and it's a little bit wide, a few feet wide. And there's two of them because they have a backup. And it's this chemical reaction that happens that when this material is warm, it releases the CO2 so we can pump it overboard off the submarine. And when it's cold, like really frigid, like just above freezing, it absorbs CO2. And it, that's the part where we're scrubbing, quote unquote, the atmosphere. So we're making oxygen, we're getting rid of the CO2, everybody's breathing, and we're happy. The primary power plant, they did increase the primary loop uh, from 53,000 liters to 55,000 liters. What that means is they can pump more primary fluid through the reactor and into the steam generator. Theoretical, you could make more steam by doing that because you have more fluid making the steam, uh, but that does not translate to more power. But you could certainly make more steam. So what they do with that, who knows, but they have this increased capability of a little bit larger primary loop, a little more fluid in the primary loop. Uh, the Salvo, ironically, is the same as the Delta One. That's shooting the ballistic missiles. You shoot them in Salvos, typically. You don't normally shoot them one at a time unless it's a test or something. So the Delta One could shoot all 12 of its missiles all at once by the end of its life. Uh, after all the upgrades it had, they could finally get that down. Uh, and if you remember between the salvos, there was a few minutes, you know, where the computers had to reset. They had to post launch all the tubes. They had to retrim the submarine to make sure it was nice and steady on the surface or even submerged. And then they could shoot more, the second salvo. So here we have a situation where the Delta II is using the same fire control system for the ballistic missile launch as the Delta I. And that's limited to 12 out of their 16 missile tubes. Yeah. So what do you do with the other four? Well, you, you wait seven minutes and you launch the other four seven minutes later, comrade. <laughs> it's, it's nuclear war. No one's really going to care when the next four come. So that's how they did it. And they could have divided that up with eight and eight if they wanted to. The point is they could not launch all of their ballistic missile tubes in one salvo because they did not change that portion of the fire control computers. All Delta IIs uh, were assigned to the third submarine flotilla stationed out of Yagnel Naya Bay in Murmansk, the Kola Peninsula. And I'll be showing you guys a picture of that a little bit later on. So they're going to make a couple of these submarines. They're all going to be based out of the same base, doing the same job in near Murmansk. 
All right, here we are. Uh, Northern Fleet is up there on the Kola Peninsula. That's what we're talking about there. All of these were built in Sev Mash. That's the Severnensk machine yard. We just combined that into one word, Sev Mash. And these are all designed down in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, near the Admiralty Shipyard. That's where the Rubin Design Bureau is. So we're designing them down there in the south, right on the Baltic Sea. We're building them in Sev Mash, and we're stationing them on the Kola Peninsula right up there. All right, let's talk about the first one. K-182, 60 years of the Great October. I should add revolution to that, but that, the name was the Great October. Whenever they say Great October, they're talking about the revolution. Okay, she's laid down 1973, launched in 75. These dates are nearly consistent with all the Delta IIs. They built all of them at the same time with a little variation in the time of the year that they began and finished. But pretty much all at the same time. 1977, she conducts a deep dive to 420 meters, certifying her hull, solidifying that 400 meters is a good test depth. And then of course they, they, they go by that by a little bit of a percentage to make sure that, you know, 400 meters won't collapse the hull, but so they push it a little bit deeper. November, 1977, the same year, she's awarded the honorary name 60 years of the great October. So it's as of that time, she's known as that name. That's very important in the Russian Navy. They get very particular about the names of their submarines and when they get them. And you could easily find yourself like I have in a conversation with a Russian sailor who is very specific as to when these names are given and when they're not. So uh, just know that if you're ever in that situation or, or that conversation. Uh, December 1977, she does her first Arctic patrol. The cool thing about this date is that it is at least one month before the R-29 Delta missile is certified for use, operational use. So it is very likely that this very first Arctic patrol that they did was the certification patrol for the R-29 Delta missile. And then about six months later, she goes out again for another Arctic patrol, spending 12 days of that patrol under the ice. So, and that's significant because our satellites in 1978 can't track these ballistic missile submarines when they're the under the ice pack. So just a little history on that. Throughout the Cold War and even today, our satellites look in different spectrums. One of those spectrums is called infrared. It's kind of a lower frequency visible, or well, it's not visible to us, but it's a low frequency light source. And whenever we start at these nuclear reactors, no matter what country it is, it creates a heat bloom and emits a lot of this infrared signature. So satellites look for heat blooms, one, to predict a nuclear missile launch, but also a reactor startup. And China's doing this, Russia's doing this, all the NATO countries are doing this with, with, with their satellites. So the benefit of that is these nuclear submarines keep their reactors on, typically, if they're not having a casualty, uh, while they're underway. And with a ballistic missile submarine in the 60s and 70s, they typically need to be near the surface to maintain communications. That makes it very easy to track because they're near the surface. We can see the, re, uh, the reactor signature, heat signature with our satellites, and we know where they're at. We're like, yep, he's still there. They don't go very fast. They're only doing like three knots when they're on patrol. So even though our satellites are only passing over them maybe once or twice a day, they, they don't go very far in that 12 to 24 hour period. So it's very easy to track them day to day to day as the satellites orbit over them, okay? But whenever they go under the ice, we don't have any of that. So now we're like, doggone it. Now we gotta go send the submarines to go get the guys. And we don't have enough submarines to do that. The Russians had way more submarines than the NATO nations had, way more. So it wasn't a one-to-one -one ratio. And plus, they were sailing in their own backyard where NATO, mostly America and the Royal Navy and the Canadians too. I'll give Canadians, of course, their, their, their due, had to travel, you know, a quarter of the way around the globe just to get to the patrol area where these guys, they're in the patrol area a day after they go underway. So it was logistically and time-wise, it was unrealistic for us to have submarines for every one of their missile patrols. But Whenever they did have a missile patrol boat out, which was continuous, we did have at least one NATO submarine in the region, in the vicinity, kind of keeping an eye on things. But we just simply in the Cold War didn't have the numbers or the geographical situation to keep up with them, which was pretty scary in the Cold War times. Thankfully, Cold War stay cold. All right, moving on to April 1980, uh, we ordered 
they're ordered into the Atlantic to sail over our SOSIS array, which is there at the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap. We, we have more arrays now, but that's the, that was the primary one back then. And that told us a couple things. One, they know what SOSIS is. They have an idea of where it's at. And uh, they might know exactly where it's at because they went over the SOSIS array and operated there for uh, a couple hours, you know, tooling around, not really doing anything, and then went back home again, went back to Nor Nor Norwegian Sea and Barents Sea and all that. And they were trying to trigger a NATO response. And of course, NATO knew this, even though NATO was kind of surprised that they went right over the array and operated, which told us a lot of stuff. But we knew that had we responded, one, they would know that we could track them which they weren't sure of because it's a brand new submarine. And they would also get information on how we would respond, which is like sending out maritime patrol aircraft and maybe even sending, you know, some ships after them or a submarine. NATO wisely didn't do any of that. So they were not able to collect intelligence on our response, but uh, the SOSA system could track the deltas. Delta one, Delta two didn't matter to Yankees. SOSA system is extremely sensitive and uh, it could track them from day one. SOSA has a lot of limitations, by the way. But we'll save that maybe for a different video. All right. Continuing with the same submarine, K-182, 60 years of the Great October, in the 1980s. From 81 to 86, she does six patrols, spending between 20 and 29 days under ice on each patrol. Now, those 20, 29 days may not be consecutive. Uh, they, of course, could be. But she darts in and out under the ice, and we're losing track of her on the satellites when she's doing that. So that's kind of what they're doing. They're trying to hide. In 1986, uh, dry docking for nuclear refuel. That's a scheduled refuel stop. The late 80s and early 90s, she does 10 more patrols in the Arctic region with no problems. Very successful submarine, the very first Delta II. In 1995, she's finally removed from surface, service rather. Uh, she has moved to the NERPA ship building for defueling, shipyard for defueling. And uh, in 2000, a civilian crew takes over. That is pretty standard, but it's the first time I'd seen it logged. Of course, there's no weapons or missiles. It's not operational anymore. It hasn't been operational in five years. And so it's just on the surface being moved around by tugboats in the shipyard as it's being dismantled and tore apart. It's even in dry dock for a lot of this time, so it doesn't need to have a military crew. Of course, the shipyard workers are just tearing it to pieces. In 2015, the reactor is in the Sidia storage facility. All right, so I've talked a lot about decommon reactors in all my sub briefs. I thought now would be a good time to show you what we do with these reactors whenever we tear them out of a submarine. And also there's nuclear ships as well. well you know, where do they store them? So look on this map here. This is the map of the, uh, in the Kola Peninsula where the storage facilities are at. And we have the spent fuel is the square and the radioactive waste is the X. Everything from Murmansk up to Saidya Bay, which we just talked about, which is right around the corner from Nerpa shipyard. And way up in the uh, northeast corner there, we have Adriva Bay, which is near the Malinya Harbor uh, shipyard. So depending on what shipyard is tearing the reactor out of these ships and submarines, depends on where they go to long-term storage sites. And these storage sites are radioactive waste sites. They're, you know, they're, they're not clean, but at least they're keeping them all in one spot. So if we mess up one part of the world with radiation and waste. It's just that one part. It's not everywhere. And so they just have these designated waste sites. And today's standards are much higher than they were back then. So um, storage today is much cleaner. It's much less radioactive, uh, much more comprehensive but uh, than it was back in, say, the 60s and 70s. But this is happening post-2001. So like I said, these sites are a lot cleaner than, than they used to be. All right, K-29, this is the second of the Delta IIs. Uh, again, kill laid 73, commissioned in 75, just like the other ones. She does six RD patrols with a uh, war game in 1978. Um, in April 1982, she does something for the first time that scares the hell out of a lot of us, uh, in that she uses four war shots of torpedoes that explode a hole in the Arctic ice. Now, in theory, we figured that they would probably do this, but they actually did it. In peacetime, with war shots, four torpedoes exploding underneath the ice to lessen the ice volume so they could punch through and launch their missiles, which they do. They drive over to the hole they just made. They surface, like you see here in the picture, and they shoot two of the R-29 Delta missiles to the test range in the Kachampa Peninsula. And that is the first record we have of the Delta II doing that. And, 
it's a uh, it's an interesting tactic. It's extremely dangerous, but I suppose when you're you know going to nuclear war, you're taking that risk. Uh, the fact that they did that for practice with war shots in peacetime was very interesting to all of us. 1983 dry dock maintenance refuel period scheduled, no problems. She comes out of dry dock. She does six patrols uh, till 1986. Uh, during her patrol 1986, she's ordered to conduct a missile launch with a dummy warhead on the missile out to the Kamchatka Peninsula in the um, you know, Siberian range over there. And something goes wrong during the test. Uh, we don't know for sure what it is, but there's obviously some kind of navigational failure to, that happens on the missile. And it could have even happened in that suborbital flight where it lines up with the astro correction. Anyway, it didn't, something didn't line up properly. This dummy warhead ends up in Northeastern China. Yeah. And it's all over the news. Like the New York times is running stories about this. The public knows about this. Uh, ironically, there wasn't a single, uh, public response that I could find anyway of China's response to this, but I'm sure China diplomats had a couple phone calls with Russian diplomats about this, you know, Reentry vehicle that are, that's now in northeastern China. Now, because they don't know the navigational error, they don't know exactly where it went in northeastern China. It's not clear if it was ever found. Uh, but again, it's not nuclear. It was a dummy warhead. So even if it was found, it would be inert. The point is they're dropping Mervs in China, and I'm sure China wasn't happy about that. That was in 1986. Keep in mind, 1986, that's the same year the Yankee sunk off the coast of Bermuda and another Delta collided with USS Augusta uh, south of Connecticut. Yeah, so 1986, tough year for the Russian Navy, especially the submarine Navy. Okay, 1987 to 1983, or 93 rather, uh, she has seven patrols, and in 1995, she's removed from service. She's cut apart reactors inside Yebe storage facility. And that is K92. K193, built in or laid down in 73, commissioned in 75, does five patrols in the 70s. In 1980, she crosses the SOSIS line to test NATO's response, just like her sister ship jet did. And NATO again doesn't respond, but now we're seeing that, yeah, they definitely know about SOSIS, they know where it's at, and let's just play it cool. You know, they're, they're slow, they're ballistic missile submarines, they can't go very far. We'll respond in a covert way a little bit later on, you know, not, not going to make it an overt, you know, event over them coming into the North Atlantic because there's no reason to raise tensions in the cold war period. Let's keep the cold war cold. Everybody stay cool. In 1985, there is a drain pipe that bursts in the engine room. It floods the bilge. They're underway submerged. They have to surface right away because even though they isolate the valve, they can't isolate uh, the, the water coming into the engine room for whatever reason, the, the pipe damage. So they have to stay surfaced. They obviously can't continue their, their patrol, but they so they want to get repaired right away and get right back to it. So they surface, they run back to the Kola Peninsula. Um, they're navigating towards their home port. It's real heavy fog. And so they're sounding their fog horn as they're transiting through here. They're on the radio trying to get the tugboats to come out and get them. Before the tugboats get to them, they come across this ship that's at anchor in heavy fog and it's broadside. And it's only because the captain was doing a very slow entry into port was he able to put on a full reverse bell and avoid colliding with an anchored ship broadside with his ballistic missile boat that had suffered a casualty in the engine room. So they, the ship's logs record them as stopping one meter from hitting the ship, but we can know that it was very close to having a collision between an anchored ship and heavy fog in a pier or in a harbor as the submarine tried to go into the pier. Eventually the tugboats get to her and they maneuver her over to her pier safely in this very heavy fog. The only reason why they pushed into a, a harbor in this condition was because they had that casualty and they needed to get it repaired to go back out on patrol again, which they did do. In 1986, 1981, 91 rather, they do eight more patrols. So that's a pretty good patrol cycle for, you know, about a five-year period for them. Remember in the past, they'd been doing maybe one a year, maybe a little less than that. But these tempos are beginning to look more like American tempos where we're averaging two a year, sometimes three, depending on the rotation of these ballistic missile submarines. Uh, she was removed from service in 1996. And in 2015, she is... Uh, moved over to the reactors, moved to side Bay. All right. K421 again, laid in 1973, launched in 1975. Um, during sea trials, 
uh, water pressure flooded shore connections from compartment eight and spilled into compartment nine at 320 meters depth. So she's submerged. She's not commissioned yet. She's in the White Sea just doing some at sea trials whenever this happens. Uh, the flooding was stopped due to the actions of the crew. The crew was uh, commended for their actions and sea trials continued. Uh, Because they had to get them done. You got to get commissioned by the end of 1975. Nothing's going to hold up the commissioning, comrade. Not even flooding in the engine room. (laughs) But now the shore connections are where whenever you're pulled into port, you plug in what looks like an enormous, cartoonishly large uh, electric plug into your submarine. Yeah, it looks ridiculously big because it is. uh, Because it has to supply a large number of amps is why it's so big. But these connections are simply epoxy around some copper metal that is the wiring. And a lot of times that epoxy, uh, it doesn't sit right or it doesn't seal right, especially in cold weather climates. You know, it shrinks and grows a little bit depending on the heat around it. Anyway, there's all sorts of factors that could cause this casualty from happening. I could easily see this happening on a lot of boats. Um, A flooded shore connection is not common, but something that's unique to American boats is on the few times we've had flooded shore connections, it certainly didn't go into the submarine. It didn't go, it didn't go into the people tank. So they have a weird shore electrical connection that appears to be one side of it inside the submarine, inside the pressure hull. So that's an interesting note about the design of these submarines. That's not safe, but I don't think safety is their number one concern at this time when they're designing submarines. Commissioned in 1975 after that problem is repaired and she puts to sea. In 1977, winter storms uh, keep the submarine in port, but she's supposed to go out on patrol, comrade. We got to support the Soviet Union. The mission is, you know, we got to get the next award. We're not going to sit here at the port. Storm be damned. So they get three tugs out in this massive storm that's, you know, waves are rocking and rolling as they're going out the polyolary inlet. And um, they pull her out of the pier and push her down the river. And sure enough, they're taking what the logs say is 50 degree rolls. Now, 50 degree rolls is like a carnival ride. It is insanely left and right rolling around. How they're maintaining a course with 50 degree rolls, I don't know. It's got to be the tugboats pushing them along. Keep in mind, the tugboats are rocking and rolling too in this high sea state. A crew member falls topside while handling these lines with the tugboats, breaks some of his ribs. They stuff him down the hatch and take him with him. Um, He's back on his feet 10 days later, by the way. The doctor got an award for doing that, which I think they just pumped him full of amphetamines and painkillers and said he was good to go because broken ribs take a long time to heal. Certainly more than 10 days. Anyway, the point is they end up going to sea despite all this. And while they're at sea on patrol, they come up to periscope depth and uh, they're not under ice. And they poke up the periscope and they're looking around and sure enough, an ice flow comes along, bumps against the periscope and the radar and the radio antenna damages both of those. And they have to pull in and get that fixed. And that's really common. Unlike stories that you imagine with like the Titanic and all that, not every piece of ice that comes out of the Arctic region is an iceberg. The, a, a great majority of them are these flat few feet high in some cases, maybe, and sometimes they're really tall, but usually just a few feet high, flat ice flows that just kind of break off from the ice pack and just float down into the Norwegian Sea and eventually the North Atlantic. And they get smaller and smaller the more farther they go. Uh, And they don't make any noise. They're just floating out there. And if you have your periscope up, you're probably looking at the horizon, whether it's in a zoomed in or zoomed out field of view, you're not looking necessarily close, you know, whenever you're doing your search. And that's probably what happened. They probably never saw the ice coming. Sonar never heard the ice until it actually hit the periscope like, you know, a Chinese bong and uh, bounced off that and also hit the antenna. Anyway, they had to damage and they had to go in and fix that in 1977. In 1982, she test launched two missiles from the pier, which is insane to me that they're still doing this. And it's not so much that, of course, the submarine in the D-9 Delta complex is designed to launch the missiles from the surface. That's not the crazy part. The crazy part is that they're doing it from a pier where there's people and there's workers and there's office buildings and there's a a civilian population nearby because the exhaust from these missiles is toxic. It's corrosive. If you breathe it, it will kill you. It'll melt your lungs and then you'll die in your own juices. Um, And they're doing this. Of course, they're, I'm sure, moving people away from the pier. But the idea that they're launching this anywhere near a populated area is 
bonkers to me. But they do that. They do two missiles from the pier in 1982. Then they go on to do eight more patrols in the 80s into 1992. 1992, during a crew turnover. Okay, so I need to explain this. Um, crews on Russian submarines stay together as one crew for many, many years. Unlike American crews, where we kind of rotate sailors on a continual basis, one or two at a time, usually one at a time. Uh, you know, you're always getting a new crew member and somebody's always getting ready to move off. It appears as if the Russian crews join the Navy together, uh, are assigned at the same time together. They serve together for at least that one year if they're a conscript and longer if they're not. And the crew can go as one crew from a Delta two to a Delta one, you know, and that's called a crew turnover. Now, also, this is after the period where they began experimenting with the two crew concept. So it could have been uh, a normal crew turnover from say a blue crew to a gold crew. That part is not clear. Anyway, there's a crew turnover where they're getting rid of one crew and they're bringing on a whole new one. Um, a crew member comes up missing. It doesn't say really what the crew member's job is. They're down one man. And so in 1992, all this strife and political unrest is happening because the Soviet Union at this point is collapsed or collapsing. I think it's just post-collapse actually. And so they don't have a lot of the resources. They don't have a lot of the you know, communication structure that they had when the Soviet Union was big. And they send the ship's personnel, the actual crew, the yeoman, the sonarmen, the cooks, out into the Kola Peninsula off the base, trudging through the woods up and down the hills and the mountains looking for a missing crew member. Yeah, of course, they start at the submarine, and then they go out to the pier, they go out to the base, they go out to the housing. They're doing this expansive search around this base looking for this guy. This guy's clearly missing. Well, they don't find him. Eventually, the base police take over the responsibility of the search. They don't do anything. They're like, whatever, comrade. Yeah, we got it from here. They just basically lost a man. The family is distraught. They're like, well, where's our son? You know, well, they go back to the submarine, which they've had some people on submarine during the whole time, of course, to take care of the reactor and whatever. And uh, they're getting ready to go underway. And they find the boy's body in the engine room in a locker. And the report is he was hiding in a locker so he didn't have to be found or because he didn't want to do a job or anyway, he was hiding. Uh, it is also the possibility that he w had an accident, hurt himself, um, and the people found him dead and didn't want that to delay the underway. I mean, I can't imagine a more nightmarish scenario than that, but it is possible that there was some other factor than he was just hiding in the engine room of a, of a submarine because there's not a lot of places to hide on a submarine where other people won't find you for long periods of time, even if it is a locker. So it's possible that something else happened and they tried to hide the body. That is what I think a more likely scenario as not as ghoulish as, as that is. Anyway, that happened in 1992. It was a real mess. Of course, terrible for the family. In 1996, she's finally removed from service. And in 2010, she is, um, ripped apart in Nerpa shipyard and her reactor is put in temporary storage over there. Uh, there's no record of the reactor being moved after that, but we can assume that it's probably in long-term storage by now. Let's hope anyway. All right. So those are the four Delta twos. And I want to make this very clear that there are four Delta twos. Okay. But there was a fifth submarine in 1974 being built a Delta submarine being built at the seven mass shipyard. And we, NATO, assumed that it was going to be the fifth Delta II. Why not? Uh, and it wasn't until actually she was launched or where we could get some good photographs of her and take a look at her missile deck and notice how much taller it is than the other ones. This submarine, this K-424, began its life as a Delta II, but ended its construction life uh, with the D-9R, missile complex installed and that's the delta three missile complex that's the next submarine brief we're going to be talking about the d9r missile complex the missiles that she shoots which are the uh, r29r which is the ssn 18 ballistic missile has a completely different uh, set of advantages and improvements that we're going to go over but the big visual giveaway between a delta one and two and the delta three is how much taller the missile housing is after the sale. Look at how much taller it is. It's, it's, a, it's above the Fairwater Plains now. 
And once we saw that, the CIA actually saw it with photo recons. They said, wait a minute, we've got a Delta three now. What's this new missile? And to, and to the CIA's credit, they guessed properly. They guessed in 1976 that it was the SSN-18, and they were right. So the CIA screws up a lot of stuff, but they got this one right. All right, so K-425, correction, 424 was reclassified Delta III uh, during construction after launch, so before commissioning. And that's where we're going to pick up in the next Subbrief. So some final thoughts about the Delta II. Uh, the transition period to a longer missile range capability was a great improvement because it lessened the amount of time it took for these uh, hulls to get on station. They could go underway and within a day or two be on station and that added to their deployment capability. Remember the Yankees deployment capability was about 60 days and that was limited by food and a lot of other things. But she also had a long transit time so even though she had a 60 day capability, you know, maybe only 40 of those days are gonna be on station because she has to get down into the North Atlantic near Bermuda to do her job or near Hawaii to do her job on the Pacific side. Well, the Delta II doesn't need to do any of that. She, she can do her job from the pier. She can do her job from under the ice pack, you know, anywhere. And so, and that was all due to this new missile. Okay, the ability to stay close to home waters, like I said, had continuous maritime air support. I mentioned that in the beginning. Every time the Delta II went out, she always had um, a Bear Foxtrot with her or some other long-range maritime aircraft. It wasn't always a Bear Foxtrot, but she had multiple support vessels around her. Uh, under ice um, capability with the Delta II, uh, it was difficult track via satellite, infrared imaging, like we said. Uh, the SOSIS tests were bold actions that initially caught NATO by surprise, but into the 80s, we began to expect them because they continued this process with future submarine builds. And this is a significant improvement in capability from even the Delta I, all because of the new missile. Uh, she's a little bit quieter, you know, a little bit better in that case, but it's really that long range missile that changed everything about the Delta II. All right. So that's the sub brief for the Delta II, the Marina M, the Marina Modernized. I want to thank very much the department heads and division officers of our Patreon. You guys are extremely generous uh, beyond anything I imagined. Uh, with the department heads, I never imagined somebody donating or pledging so much money that I would need a department head level. So we created one for JB and, uh, of course, anybody else that wants to join the department heads. We'd love to have you. We'll add your name here to the card 